grateful to my dear friend, Rav Avidan, who's been working on this issue for many years and has been a real pioneer and visionary to move this forward. And to our other uh, two great guests, um, former Knesset member Friedman and um, Rabbi Dr. Danny Gordis. And I'm grateful to Rav uh, Yaakov Chaitavsky uh, for his partnership today and our new partnership with Valley Beit Midrash and BMH BJ Synagogue in Denver. And this is the first of many opportunities for us to learn uh, learn Torah and um, uh, and engage in Jewish thought and life together. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Rabbi Chaitovsky to launch off the program. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, especially to my uh, BMH BJ congregants and uh, students who are here. It's lovely to see all of you, and it's lovely to partner with everyone. I see friends and colleagues from uh, my rabbinic journeys, and um, it's very uh, very nice, and thanks Rev Shmuley and VBM for making this uh, possible. Uh, we're going to have a very interesting conversation today. We're going to hear some interesting points of view about a very critical issue um, <clears throat> that perhaps Israel hasn't had to deal with uh, for a good number of years until it became a state and attained sovereignty. And I'll let the speakers flesh that out. But our, we're going to introduce our speakers today. We have three um, wonderful presenters who have been involved in this issue and have thought about it. <clears throat> uh, first, former uh, member of Knesset Tehillah Friedman, who is a social entrepreneur, a director in the nonprofit world, a writer, speaker, a jurist, um, a, a liver and lover of Jerusalem, and mother of five. And Rabbi Dr. Daniel Gordis, is the vice president of Shalem College, a senior Coret fellow and head of the college's humanities program and um, a, a speaker on behalf of Israel and uh, a writer whose, uh, whose words are well worth uh, reading and even assimilating. Rabbi Avidan Friedman is an educator at the Shalem Hartman Institute's high school and post high school program, a co-founder of an organization known as Yan Shuf, which is dedicated to establishing the moral limits for Israeli weapons exports. And there's a website, of course, you can find it on uh, the VBM webpage uh, to get a link to see uh, a little bit more about the important work that this organization does. Wonderful, thank you so much, Rabbi Katowski. And uh, thank you all for being here those of you who are on the Zoom and those of you who are in the live stream. You know, we have to start, um, uh, of course, by stating just our love uh, for, uh, for Israel and our support for Israel. Uh, whether we are living there, we are living from afar, our full love, uh, which emerges from our engagement in the full complexity of, of uh, this, this uh, brilliant and blessed opportunity for us to have sovereignty and to actualize that sovereignty, not only for survival, but for our highest moral aims. And we love the potential for what we're striving for. <clears throat> and so we frame that conversation there um, to understand um, that we are concerned with our security, we are concerned with our survival, we are concerned with our strength, and we are concerned with our moral responsibilities. And all of that is held together. But before we get to particular Israel responsibilities uh, on the arms front, we, we have to begin with the current events of the day. We are all on the edge of our seats <clears throat> as we've been watching for the last few weeks what's been happening in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm sure we have many views uh, that which are largely aligned and some diverging views on how to kind of get to resolutions. But let's begin here because it's so obvious. What is, and maybe we'll start with you, uh, Rabbi Gordis, and then we'll, go, uh, Rabbi Dr. Daniel Gordis, and then we'll go to uh, former Knesset member, Tehila Friedman, around um, what is Israel's responsibility in this? On the one hand, we have those who are saying, we need to protect ourselves. We need to be careful with Russia. On the other hand, those are saying we need to be a moral light. We need to be fully on board supporting Ukraine. And others want a mediator role, that we should be in the middle of bringing it all together. So what is our role on the international arena at a time like this? Well, first of all, let me just say I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be part of this conversation with Rabbi Abidan and Rabbi Shmuley and, and uh, Rabbi Yaakov Chaitovsky. It's just really an honor to be part of this conversation. Tehila and I were actually on a panel earlier today in Haifa 
and then had a two and a half hour drive back from Haifa to Jerusalem. So we could probably just switch roles and speak for each other at this point. Um, but we probably won't do that. We'll do that next time. But anyway, so I just really, first of all, want to say that it's really a, a great honor to be part of this conversation. Uh, look, Reb Shmuley, I mean, you're asking really the one of the hardest questions. This has been an exceedingly, an exceedingly frustrating and also, I think, by the way, quite frightening time for Israel. And I'll try to explain why very, very briefly. And I know that Tehila also has some thoughts on this, and, I, and I'm going to be brief so that she can pick it up and wherever she wants to go. Uh, Israel has one clear responsibility in this, and its responsibility is to survive. That is the whole, that's the whole story. And um, it would be nice to be able to do that and do lots of other kinds of things. I wrote a piece that came out yesterday, got a lot of flack for it. Um, but I wrote a piece yesterday saying that I thought Israel had failed miserably in terms of the Ukrainian refugee issue. Uh, we should we had an opportunity here to really shine a light on our ability to be a different kind of a country. By the way, for our own citizens as well, young Israelis who are 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, 25, who are looking to see how we respond, uh, I think we've actually failed them. I don't think we failed them out of wickedness, but I think we failed them out of that balance of trying to take care of ourselves or whatever we can get into that. But I just want to say, so that's one area in which I think we have not done well. An area which we don't ever talk about where we have done well uh, is that Israelis who know history have all been able to overcome our knowledge of what we know the Ukrainians did not that long ago. Uh, the only people in the world who enjoyed slaughtering the Jews during the Shoah more than the Poles were the Ukrainians. And the following is not hyperbolic or hypothetical or made up. But there were literally instances when the Nazis kind of got to that area or, or others got to that area. And the Ukrainians actually pointed out and said, look, we did it already. We took care of it. Um, so, I mean, Israelis know that there was a horrible history here. And I think the fact that Israelis overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly have their hearts broken for the Ukrainians is actually an accomplishment of no small order that we were not forgetting history. But we understand that these people were not those people. And it's not, this is not the moment to try to figure out to what extent those attitudes have prevailed. This is the moment to try to, um, to, try to save, save human lives. I'm going to make two quick points. Uh, one of them is very similar to what Natan Sharansky wrote uh, in the Wall Street Journal a couple of days ago, but I think it's critically important. Israel uh, has to play a very, very uh, sort of, an, of, of a very delicate dance on the one hand, siding with the West at the UN, on the other hand, trying not to tick Putin off too much, uh, because we actually have a border with Russia. Uh, it, on the maps, it says Syria, but it's essentially a border with Russia. Now, some Israelis are pointing out, by the way, that that Russian Air Force is probably not nearly as fierce as we once thought it was. Um, but others are suggesting that it might be that the Russian Air Force in Europe is performing the way that it is, because many of their better people are actually over here. I have no idea. But I've heard both of those theories said by people who are smart and who supposedly know what they're talking about. Uh, but we have a very, very, very uh, delicate dance to dance here. And I just want to point out, as did Nathan Sharansky, uh, that we have to dance that dance because of the failure of the United States. If Barack Obama had actually kept that red line in the sand when it came to Syria and the use of chemical weapons, it would have been clear that the United States means business in the international arena. Uh, if, the, if the first uh, treaty, the nuclear treaty with Iran, not been so bad. If the United States had been able to hold Iran to its word and all sorts of violations that were not allowed, it had not allowed violations to go by, uh, it would have been very, very different. Israel would not face the threat from Iran, which would make it vulnerable to Russia, etc. This is a huge domino thing. And we have to be very careful. It's frustrating. We would like to be wholly with the West. We would like to be authors of the, mo the, the motions at the UN and so on and so forth. Um, but we're not there. We're tragically not there, I think, in large measure because we have, um, well, because the United States has not played the role that it should play in international affairs, to my mind. Last point. Um, this is also a very scary time for Israel. And it's a very scary time for Israelis. When I talk to my students, when I talk to my neighbors, I talk to people in shul, not during davening, of course, but at other times. Um, when I talk to all these people, what you hear them saying is, what we're learning from this is, that a large country can swallow up a small country and it'll get lots of moral support and they'll ship lots of arms. But at the end of the day, the world is not really doing a hell of a lot to protect Ukraine. And it could be Iran and Israel or Iran through Hezbollah and Israel. And we'll get a lot of moral support, but at the end of the day, we're gonna be on, on our own. And uh, I think that's very sobering. I think it's very true. 
And that's why I say at the end, I think that Israel's most important obligation to the Jewish people is to survive. It would be nice to be able to do that and lots of other things. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Um, but Rabbi Shuli asked, what's our fundamental obligation? It is to do what we need to do to make sure that we are here for the Jewish people for many hundreds of years, God willing. Thank you. Thank you. Very thoughtful. Um, and former Knesset uh, member Tehila Friedman, if you'd like to weigh in on how you think about the Israeli role in the current conflict as well. It's interesting. I'm listening to uh, uh, first, and <laughs> I should say, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Here it's also good night, and I'm sorry for the noise. Having five kids and this time of the day, it's uh, it's pretty noisy. Um, so I'm listening to Professor Gordis, and I think that it's interesting. Maybe because I'm I'm Sabra and I was born here, and I can't even imagine situation with not having Israel, I kind of take it for granted. So for me, this sentence of the first, the most important thing is to, an uh, obligation is to survive. I wouldn't say su uh, such a thing. I mean, I, I feel that surviving is, of course we have to survive, but, but having Jewish state, for me, it's not only for surviving. It's also for purpose. I feel that uh, um, it's like it's like being a Jew in general. Uh, it's for something. Uh, so so I feel Israel obligation is is not only to survive. Is also to find um, is to find to find the right way to combine real political with moral uh, obligations. And that's in general what I think we should try to do. And it is very, very delicate dance. Uh, you mentioned Sharansky before, I sat with Nathan the day that Putin gave his big speech. I had the privilege to work with him years ago. And, and he said that he, 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 he told me that he called Prime Minister Bennett and told him that he think Israel should take a very strong position here. And we spoke about the combination between morality and politics. And I thought, you know, it's only because um, back then Jews could, you know, came to the, the to the country saying you should um, put sanctions on Russia in order to take people like Sharansky out of jail. It's only because of that that he's free. Um so so saying everything is only real politic, had we thought so back then, we, we wouldn't have nothing but out, you know, free. So yeah, so it's a very, very delicate dance, and it's very dangerous for Israel because of Syria and what he said about the border and because of the Iranian issue. And yet I feel that Israel should. Should, should stand in the right side of the history. Uh, it is, yeah, I, I, I don't want to simplify it. It's very, very complicated. And I feel that, that Prime Minister Bennett and also Lapid are trying to dance this dance. Um, my feel that we, we could we could be more, um, you know, it, it's easy to give advice from the, from the coach. I, I, I just say that I, I wish Israel would, would combine grand politics with moral obligations, sometimes they feel we can do better job. Oh, fantastic, thank you so much. So, okay, so now zo um, zooming out to the, the bigger picture we've been looking at for a number of years now, <clears throat> um, we know that there are countries around the world doing atrocious things. And we know that Israel has the opportunity to um, have financial gains as a, as a, as a trading partner um, but also has some potential moral responsibilities around how weapons are used. So Rabbi Don, can you fill us in on kind of the current situation around arms sales in relationship to Israel now? What does Israel do? Where does Israel sell arms? Where, where, where does the rest of the world stand in terms of what they produce and how they sell? What, what, what are some of the norms out there right now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rav Shmuley, for the opportunity to be here. And uh, it's a great, great honor to be with uh, to, to be with Tila and and, uh, and Daniel, um, to be with such um, 
two figures that I look up to so much in, in terms of what it means to to strive and to aspire and to, and to move Israel to a place that is strong and strong morally. And I'll just connect, you know, before speaking about the, the nuts and bolts of the arms issue, I'll, um, I'll, I'll bridge the the conversation we just had and, and the thoughts we just uh, we just heard um, that I, I think the the survival of the Jewish state is is absolutely paramount. Um, but but at the same time, we we have to um, we have to realize that 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 can be a, a, a kind of a catch all um, claim that that then comes and justifies everything. Um, you know, um, Rabbi Gordas said that, you know, you see the, the, um, the policy that was taken at least initially, and even now we're kind of fumfing around in order to get to a better place as far as the Ukrainian refugees, but that also the, the claims that are made in order to, to defend not taking in refugees are about survival. If we, if we bring in these people, then we'll, we'll be bringing in hundreds of thousands of, of, uh, of, of refugees and they won't leave and et cetera, et cetera. So that claim of, uh, you know the the boogeyman of of an existential threat is is always there. Um, it, it's always something that that people can can bring up um, for in order to justify anything. And um, and it's something that we we in as Jews in terms of our history we really really struggle with. Um, I think it's um, it's it's almost very much built in. I think the point about our ability to forget. Um, what the Ukrainians did to us in order to to be to be to have empathy for what's going on is a wonderful demonstration of, of what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, if we go all the way back to the Exodus from Egypt and and the way that the Torah spoke about that, you know, the Torah says that our takeaway from the Exodus from Egypt is not to hate the Egyptians and it's not to to make sure that we're powerful enough that we never again bring back uh, or, or sent back to Egypt. It's to make sure that we don't become um, Pharaoh and we don't become the Egyptians. And that's the, the role of memory. So, you know, the role of memory here could, could lead us in, in, in different ways. And I think that our, our survival really, as, as Dila said so beautifully, it needs to be a survival of purpose. Um, and, and again, I think that, that this, the issue of arms really highlights um, how, um, how that, that, that claim of, of survival can be, um, can be abused. I think it's really the 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 extreme, in fact, of, of how it can be abused. So just to talk about the facts for for a few minutes, um, Israel is the eighth um, largest um, weapons exporter in the world in absolute terms. The ten largest weapons exporters in the world account for ninety percent of the world's weapons export. Israel itself accounts for 3% of all of the weapons that are sold in the world. Um, tiny little Israel. So 3% isn't big, but this is tiny Israel. It's um, in relation to our to our size, it's, it's 30 times our size, um, you know, relative to the world. Um, so we're a very, very significant player. Um, we sell arms to 130 states. We don't know um, the identity of all of those states because the, the facts about Israel's weapons exports are, are kept very, very heavily, very, very heavily under wraps. Um, but we do, know, we do know some things. So we do know that about 50% um, of that weapons export is going to the United States and is going to um, states in the European Union and countries in the European Union, meaning over 50% of of what is actually an $8 billion industry annually um, is going to countries which we would speak about as countries that have checks and balances, countries, um, democratic countries that are not running to go to war um, and countries where there is certainly in, in my opinion, um, an absolute um, moral obligation to use weapons. Um, to in order to defend their their populations. In other words, I'm certainly um, not coming from a, a a position of pacifism that says that weapons are uh, are not legitimate morally. I pray every day, many many times for peace, and and I hope for peace. But in today's world, um, we need weapons. Countries need weapons in order to defend themselves, and that's and that's absolutely legitimate. 
Um, however, some portion of Israel's weapons export um, is also going to countries um, that are not democracies, countries that are dictatorships, countries where those weapons are being used to maintain a dictatorship, which means to crush any kind of civil opposition or the attempt to, uh, to gain civil rights. Um, Israel's weapons can be sold to countries that are in the midst of of bloody civil wars where civilians are being killed by both sides. Sometimes Israeli weapons are, are actually going to both sides of those conflicts. Um, that was the case in South Sudan after um, after the independence in 2011, then deteriorated into civil war. Um, and Israeli weapons have also been sold to countries that have literally literally committed genocide, um, as as in the, the case in, in Burma and in Myanmar in 2017. Um, with the, the Rohingya minority. So the large majority um, of, of Israeli weapons, I would say are going to, uh, to legitimate places, but there is a not insignificant minority. Um, and I think as, as soon as you're supporting mass killing, it's, it's not insignificant. Um, and so there is a not insignificant portion that's going to to really supporting terrible, terrible things, the kind of things that, um, you know, when we're talking about purpose, um, really defy and 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 contradict our our purposes as, as Jews and, and as a Jewish state. Um, as far as as how we are compared to other nations in the world. So so Israel, unfortunately, in, in this area is very um, exceptional uh, in the negative sense of, of the world. Rabbi Chaitovsky mentioned that this is an issue that, of course, the Jewish people until we got to sovereignty didn't need to to deal with. Um, and, and even once we were sovereign for for a number of years, we didn't need to deal with. And, and even when we did start dealing with it, the questions of um, of existential threats and how precarious our existence was, were, I would say, much, much more um, pressing. Nowadays, thank God, in 2022, Israeli export uh, on the whole is $114 billion. Um, that's the, the amount that Israel is, is selling to the world. So 8 billion of that, less than 10% is weapons. We're providing a lot of wonderful things in the world. Um, and, and so, Nowadays, um, it's a different kind of a calculus that that certainly needs to be had, um, and where we stand in relation to the world is is not very good. There are 110 states in the world that have uh, ratified a, a national an international arms trade treaty, which limits arms sales to any country that's engaged in uh, gross violation of human rights. The United States also has its own set of laws, even though it hasn't ratified the treaty, uh, known as the Leahy Laws, which also um, which also places those kinds of moral limitations. Israel, by law, does not have that. It just doesn't exist. Um, it hasn't been it hasn't been set into place, um, and and that means that we are in a, a place that our um, the countries that we're similar to as far as arms exports and legislation are Russia and China and North Korea. That's that's our neighborhood certainly not the, the kind of a neighborhood we like to see ourselves in and think about ourselves in. Amazing. Thank you so much. So, Professor Gordas, um, some people suggest that, you know, Jews, Israel, we don't have the luxury to operate by moral ideals. Um, we need all the friends we can get, you know, and I wonder how that idea plays out for you in relation to arms sales. Like, are there cases where we should say, like, we that the moral imperative to not sell arms to a certain country should outweigh uh, the value of having a new national threat. Yeah, absolutely. It should say that. So I think I've, I, I somehow stumbled into the position here of being the guy that doesn't think that Israel should exist for a purpose. Um, <laughs> if I thought that, I don't think I'd be on this thing. I'd be fast asleep at this time of the day because I get up at four to write. But um, uh, so I, I just want to make it very clear. I actually think that Israel's purpose is to survive, obviously, but also to live in a moral kind of a way. Otherwise, I would not have, you know, tried to do whatever a little bit I could to support Yan Shuf and to be part of this event and so on and so forth. Now, this is an area in which Israel doesn't really need to do what it's doing. And I would have to suggest that I think a lot of this is, as, as, um, as Abidan pointed out, 
is really a profit motive. And without getting into all of the politics, which um, which uh, which which Rabbi Dan knows much better than I do, there are there are notable Israeli politicians who could block this uh, relatively easily in certain cases and have chosen not to do that. There, there, there are people whose names all of you know. So look, you know, I think that Israel needs to do a moral accounting here. Israel needs to do a serious cheshbon on nefesh. It's not the same thing as uh, what to say or do with Putin on the Syrian-Russian border. It's just, there, there's, no, there's no immediacy here. Um, there was this issue with NSO, uh, which is Israel's spy, spy software, which was used apparently in certain kinds of very unpleasant circumstances. That's not all very clear, by the way. There were rumors here that the police had used it on Israeli citizens as well without authorization. And those rumors seem at least to have been incorrect at present. So we don't know. There's a lot we don't know. But as a matter of principle, I would, I, I would say, um, yeah, Israel has a, several purposes for which it exists. Its first purpose is to exist. And again, as Natan Sharansky pointed out in a different setting in the last week, uh, he pointed out that if you're Ukrainian and Jewish, you don't have a question, is there going to be a place that I'm going to be able to go? Um, we used to say, uh, that, you know, there aren't Jews that are in trouble. This whole idea of Israel as a refuge, it's a kind of a quaint idea. It cut back from the days when people would be in kibbutzim and, you know, dance around the campfire with accordions and all of that kind of stuff. And we don't dance around the campfire with accordions anymore. And there's no Jews that need refuge. Tragically, Jews that need refuge is a perennial issue. Um, and that is one of Israel's purposes. Another purpose for Israel, and I think that we don't think about this nearly enough, is to transform the Jewish people's existential condition. And that is, that is, that is an extraordinary accomplishment of, of Israel. And I want to come back to that in just one second. Uh, but to transform the Jewish people's existential condition is not only to make them safe and not only to create a cultural rebirth, which we have here in ways that couldn't exist anywhere else in the world and so on and so forth. A part of it is, what do you do when you finally do have power? What do you do when you finally do have arms? It's about making very, very profound moral decisions, which it's one thing to make on the pages of the Gemara 2000 years ago or 2500 years ago, a little bit less. Uh, or, 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 and to make it in real life. So we have real obligations, it seems to me, to rein this way in uh, when it's exclusively a profit motive to simply say, it's just not how we do our business. Uh, and if it is a security issue, then to try to do whatever we can to try to make this, we, we should not be on the list that Rabbi Friedman pointed out. We just should not, we should not be on, on that list. The one, one last thing I want to point out about this, if I have any hesitation about, about this conversation, and I don't really, otherwise I wouldn't be on the conversation, but I think that it's always dangerous that, that Israeli citizens should get involved in this issue is patently obvious to me. In other words, this should become actually at a, different, at a time when we're not all looking at the Ukraine and Russia and so on and so forth. This should be an issue that Israeli citizens are up in arms about. Um, there are many such issues. Um, and this should be one of them. And I think that the work that Jan Shuf is, is doing and is going to do is God willing going to move us, is going to God willing move us uh, in, in that direction. That, that's critically clear. What I'm a little bit less comfortable with, not tonight, but just in general, is having these conversations with people who, as devoted and loving as they are of the Jewish state, are not Israeli citizens. Um, I think, for example, that breaking the silence plays a very important role in Israel. I don't like all of its tactics. I don't believe all of its testimony. But the idea that there is an organization that allows soldiers to talk publicly about what they experienced in the army, of things that they experienced that they did were not okay, that organization should exist in a democracy. I don't have to love everything about it but I have to defend its right to be. The minute that, that, uh, that, that uh, breaking the silence though began to try to get EU funding by doing all sorts of uh, you know, um, exhibits and so forth in Spain and in other kinds of places, that was the moment that I felt very uncomfortable. And we're not there tonight, don't get me wrong, I'm not making that analogy. I don't wanna be accused of both saying that Israel doesn't have a purpose and that, uh, and that this is the same thing, it's not. But I, I think that anytime we have a conversation about these issues, especially outside of Israel, we need to remind ourselves that this is a critically important issue that needs to be put in context. And I wanna come back to purpose for one second. What was that purpose? The purpose really isn't to survive. Survival is a means to an end. What's the, what's the end? The end is to transform the existential condition of the Jew. The end was to create a place where Jews would live without a pressure to assimilate. The end was to create a place where Jews would live where they wouldn't have to confront anti-Semitism. The end was to take a Hebrew language, give it rebirth, and to produce a cultural flourishing that couldn't exist anywhere else. The end is the fact that you have more people studying in yeshiva today than you had in pre-war Europe at its very, very height. The end is the fact that people here, secular and religious, 
are going to, are, are, the, the Jewish calendar is part of their lives. The end here is that you can be totally secular in Israel and be fairly certain that you're going to have Jewish grandchildren, which for sure cannot be said if you're totally secular outside the state of Israel. And I could go on and on and on. I'm saying all of that only because I think we need to wrap our critique about this issue, which is a profound moral critique, which needs to be voiced in a reminder that not just I love Israel, but now I want to say this, but I love Israel. Israel was created for the following purposes. In the major purposes for which Israel was created, it is an unmitigated, overwhelming success, period. Now what I want to try to do is make it even better. And to make it even better, what I want to try to do is each of us pointing to the issues where we think uh, the moral record should be purified a little bit more. Jan Schuf pointing, in my view, to one of the many but exceedingly important examples of that. Wow, very powerful. Thank you for that. And what a vision of uh, the role of the state and, and the end goals. That was very powerful. Rav Avidan, do you want to counter on this point of the role of the diaspora Jew? Uh, I mean, we all agree it has to be handled with enormous um, sensitivity and be packaged in context. Um, uh, but I wonder how you would think in your work about engaging diaspora Jewish communities in this work um, as, as opposed to keeping it primarily or solely internal? Um, I think I, I don't want to counter um, because I, 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 I do largely, uh, I, I agree with, with, uh, with what Daniel said. Um, I, I think first of all, it is, it is definitely tricky. It is, um, I didn't start this work um, in order to, you know, to give more fodder to people who are looking to, to besmirch Israel. Um, that's, you know, that's not what, what I'm in this for. At the same time, um, I'm not willing to, to do what some, some people who criticize this work sometimes say, which is, you know, don't air dirty laundry. And, you know, by talking about this, you, you're, you're giving fodder to, to the Israel haters. Um, I'm not willing to do that because if we have this dirty laundry, if we don't air it, it's, it gets very stinky in here. So, so we need to do something about it. Um, and, you know, with, as with any other, you know, social ills where, where there are, where there's that kind of a, of a critique. So, so I think we, we certainly need to talk about it. Um, we started recently uh, a campaign on, on social media. Um, and when you start pushing something out on social media, so the, the trolls come out and I was, you know, I was counting, I was like, is it going to be a matter of minutes or hours until somebody starts accusing me of taking money from the European Union or et cetera, et cetera. So, so it was, it, was, it took a couple of hours, meaning that critique come, comes out, whether it is, uh, whether it's actually based in fact or not. Um, and that's also part of, um, part of my, my, my thinking here. In other words, as soon as you start to raise certain issues, unfortunately, there, there is a knee-jerk response. But the, the, so I think we really need to think about the core. And the, and the core issue, the fundamental issue is, at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, diaspora jury, they're stakeholders in what Israel does. Um, and I think that's, that's a point that's also critical to speak about. And, and so I don't think that it is, um, as with other issues, I don't think it's fair to keep them out of the conversation because um, be, because because they don't live here, which which isn't what what Daniel was saying. Um, with all of the caution that we need to have with how the conversation is had, I think it's Israel is a place that we all want to be proud of, um, and and we need to be proud of, and it's important it's important for 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 all Jews to feel like they have a stake and they have a part in it. Um, it's important for for practical reasons, for strategic reasons, it's important in terms of their support. But but it's important because I think that's what that's what the Jewish state is. I really believe that it's that it is the the home of, of all of the Jewish people, and so it's something we need to take seriously. Um, so so one thing is you know we I I think that that the diaspora jury deserves to to know about it as Israeli jury deserves to know about it, and it really is something that has been kept hidden. Um, and deserves to have the chance to to advocate and to fight for for Israel, placing itself in a better place. And the last thing I would say is, is that uh, diaspora jury also also takes a hit um, when Israel behaves badly um, with the this the the big fiasco regarding NSO's spyware. NSO is is a, is the company that's that's selling this spyware, as, as Daniel mentioned. Um, the headlines all over the world were Israeli spyware um, 
you know, is is helping dictatorship, dict, you know, dictatorial regimes um, crush oppression, and and that's something that that doesn't look good, but but it also started to make Jews all over the world feel very uncomfortable, um, because when that's a headline, then that that starts to reflect badly, and and even actually literally to to put Jews in in danger. Um, so that's it's just another reflection, I think, of the way in which we're connected. Um, you know, Marcel Vechik spoke about the 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 covenant of of fate and the covenant of destiny. We're connected in very very deep ways, and so we we need to to take responsibility for it together. Amazing. So, friends, I want to remind you: you're welcome to post questions you have in the chat, which we will get to shortly. <clears throat> in the Purim story, we celebrate the power of being an insider and an outsider. You have Esther on the inside advocating for change. You have Mordechai on the outside. There's many ways to work for change in different contexts. Uh, Ms. Friedman, so as a former legislator in Israel, can you talk a little bit about some of where the opposition is coming from? When um, when Jews are saying, we don't want blood on our hands, we don't want blood on the hands of Israel, that that there are atrocities done with weapons we're se selling, and, there, and, and then there's pushback. What are the motives? What are the what are what are the uh, stakes involved with um, with that opposition? Could you tell us about the inside conversation a little bit? Yes, I'm not sure it's so much opposition. It's more a lack of it's we it's weird, but people people maybe the last institution that people in Israel really um, believe in is the army. I mean, Sahel is enjoying a very high rate of um, support of 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 trust uh, from the general people. Um, so, so really, this issue has nothing to do with Tal, but I think people just don't know and find it very hard to believe that what Rabbi Abidan is describing is really happening. Um, and, and, and also legislator. I spoke one time with the, with the Minister of Defense about it, and he said, but Bila, I, I, I'm, I'm changing the, uh, the way there's a, like a, a subcommittee within the uh, Ministry of Defense. And, and the, we're going to look into it better, but, but you really don't need to, <laughs> you, don't, you really don't need to be so uh, worried about it. We, we're, we're, we're taking care of it. It's okay. I, and, and I don't think he lied. I think he, he really believed in it. I mean, those people, it's, it's kind of like the good guys and uh, the people from the security, you know, um, institutions and, and so people just trust them uh, and, and very hard to tell people that they shouldn't because it, it's, we want people to trust the army. I think it's important. And, and I think also it's, it's justified, uh, but it's not the same like, I mean, the army is not the same like people who used to be in the army and now doing other things and, you know, building the connection and things like that. So I, I really don't feel the position. It's like knowledge. Uh, it's like, um, or, or, or it's too much trust. Uh, it's coming from, from it's, really, it, it's, it's really coming from good places. And um, people don't know and don't want to know in many ways. Mm -hmm. the, the second thing I think, um, it's coming from really different perspective, but uh, Israeli soldiers are going through um, like seminars in ethics when, when you talk about combat units, about, you know, uh, how, you, how you say it's a, um, um, moral way to to be a soldier that's really that way of using weapons people in the intelligence units don't do it they they don't learn about it because for years um the thought was okay if you use weapons you need you know you need to be careful with how you do it but if you do intelligence you know no moral issues here and because situation changed and because uh, um, the technology become a weapon or potential weapon. And we, we need also to change the mindset about that. 
understanding is that cyber can be also um, can be also very dangerous weapon, and, and you need to train your, uh, the people who work there with what they do after after they after they're not soldiers again anymore. So those those are very two different perspectives to look at the, on the issue. But uh, and I know that I sound naive, but I really really think that people most Israelis about are naive uh, with the with the issue. And most of them, when they hear Rabbi Abidan talking, it's the first time in their life they heard about it, and uh, first time they thought about it. And I find very few people say who, who are really opposing, uh, you know, his the position. Most of them say, you know, it's it it, it must be, uh, you know, two three cases. No need to do big deal from those, you know, um, the one time it happened, thing like that. Um, so, so it's, um, you know, too much trust and lack of knowledge and also situations that have changed. Mm, very interesting. So, Rabbi Abidan, um, can you tell us a little bit of the Torah, some of the halakha that, is, that informs our thinking around this issue? I mean, obviously, we're not in Bavel. You know, we're not in a Polish dental. This is a whole new reality of where we find ourselves in, but we're still, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as Jews, deeply informed morally and, and, and halakhically by this tradition. Can you give us some of the frameworks that help us uh, think from that religious perspective? It's interesting because, you know, on the one hand, you could, um, the Mishnah speaks about the, the halakha of, of selling weapons, and from the Mishnah, it continues to the to the Talmud and from the Talmud to the commentaries and from the commentaries to the codes. Um, and, and then there are, there are articles written about it. Um, so, so you can have that, that conversation and, and, and speak about it. it in a certain sense, it makes me, it, it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable even, you know, because like it, if I could create a halachic argument that would justify arming genocidal regimes is is that the is that the use of halacha i want to you know meaning on a certain there's a, you know there's a, a certain approach which is like okay first of all there's there's common sense first of all there's basic morality uh rev cook speaks about you know a natural morality that your your torah needs to be first of all guided by that um so so i i would first of all you know just just mention that the natural sense of this is not something that we can be a part of in, in any way. Um, that that said, it, it's interesting that the, the the Mishnah does does discuss it. It actually discusses it in the context of uh, of of idol worship. Meaning, after speaking about the prohibition of supporting idol worship, um, it talks about the prohibition of supporting um, immoral use of of weapons. Um, Presumably, although there are some, some um, there there is one one explanation actually of of Rashi which says um, going back to to where we started the conversation a little bit that the the problem with weapons is only about how it might affect us. But the 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 more um, the the more prominent position is that Jewish people have a a moral vision for the world, and that moral vision for the world part of it involves. Um, ethical monotheism um, and and the end of idol worship and and part of it involves you know the ethical part of it is is an end to to war to to wanton blood uh, bloodletting and and so the Mishnah says that it is forbidden to provide the means to doing that um, to uh, to essentially to non Jews um, but I would say the correct way to understand that is to to non Jews and afterwards also Jews who are going to use that improperly. Um, what's very ironic, just that the the end of the discussion is that at the the end of the discussion in the Talmud, um, there's a kind of anonymous um, question which is which is raised, which is, well, but wait a second, we do do this. Jews sell weapons, and then the the answer is, well, we sell it to the Persians who who protect us. So it's interesting to think about the the Persians who it, you know, we are. Um, 
in contemporary times thinking about the, the threat of Iran, and we are right before Purim and thinking about the Persians as well. Um, but in that very, in that window in history, the Persians were the ones who were protecting us. And so, uh, and so we needed to sell them guns. Um, and what's fascinating and to me quite troubling um, is that that idea that there is an, uh, an allowance halakhically to sell to the Persians that who protect us um, at a time, during a time of, of exile, during a time of, of a lack of Jewish power was then um, exported to the time of, of Jewish power in order to say anything which serves our interest survival is is okay. Um, and and there's a real irony to that because as we've said, I think, um, and as I believe that the return to Jewish sovereignty is a great, great um, opportunity and a great challenge. Um, Tehila said it very beautifully. Again, Rabbi Cook writes, uh, writes about that, that writes about this, that we we now have the opportunity to demonstrate a, a moral ethic of power. Um, and I think that's also, to, in my eyes, that's also what, what Jewish statehood is about. It's also about the cultural revolution that Rabbi Gordas was talking about, but on a national level, um, you know, even if we could have some island where Jews could do all of those things and learn Torah and develop all those things and, you know, in Uganda or whatever it is, but, but something about what, what, what Jewish power is, is also on a national level developing a, a, moral, um, a moral ethic of power. And I think you know, we spoke about the, the motivation of, the, of profit um, and, and, and this brings us to the prophet, um, P-H-E-T. Um, I think this is what the, the prophets in the times of the first temple speak about again and again and again and again. The kings are worried about power and they're worried about alliances and the prophets say you need to be worried about the, the moral fiber of this country in order to survive. If we don't, and for me, that's, that's an existential threat as well. I think if we don't live up to this challenge of, of moral use of power, it's also an, an existential threat to us. Rav Abidan, so there's a question in the chat from Jack Jacobson who asks, who are the decision makers in the sale of weapons? Who, who are the decision makers, the gatekeepers, the authorities that are involved in this whole process? And as activists within Israel, what does it look like to try to create change given who those decision makers are? So, so right now the, the decision lies um, in the corridors of the, uh, of the Ministry of Defense. The Ministry of Defense has a, has a branch which, um, which oversees all weapons exports. So um, I, I, before 2007, that didn't exist, but as of 2007, anybody who wants to sell weapons needs to get a number of licenses. And so those licenses are issued by a, a group of people um, within the, the Ministry of Defense um, with input from the foreign um, from the foreign ministry as well, um, and they make the decisions. The problem is we don't know why they make those decisions. In other words, we there is a as Tehila mentioned there there is consistently a claim that moral issues and human rights are taken into account, but there's no transparency. Um, we don't know what the the criteria are. Um, what we do know is, for example, in the span of five years from 2012 to 2017, 99.8% of the final level of, uh, of requests for licenses were granted. Out of some 8,000 requests, there were 21 that weren't granted. So they are very, very rarely saying no. Um, the, so the activism is um, that we want, we want Israel to pass a law, and, and a law um, which would in which would empower a, a, a panel, a committee of people, which would also still include, of course, people from the Ministry of Defense and people from the Foreign Ministry, but also have academics and, uh, and people who are versed in, in human rights and international human rights law, um, and for them to make the decision, as again, as happens in many, many countries in the world, and then for the Jewish people to know who are we saying no to, for that at least, to be transparent, just not who's everybody who we're selling to, that's very, very sensitive, but who are we saying no to because of, uh, because of these? Um, and what activism looks like um, from, from my point of view is the, the critical, critical piece here is really the, um, the power of the people. It's really the voice, the moral voice of the people and the moral demand of the people. That is for me, the, the factor that can, um, that can move things. I mean, there's, there are obviously, as we mentioned, powerful forces 
um, that want to maintain a status quo, but this isn't something which is in the interests of, of the average uh, citizen. And, and as Tehila said, uh, the average citizen, I think, has a, has a gut reaction, no, this isn't what we should be doing. But, but as she said, they don't know about it. A lot of people don't know about it, don't think about it, prefer not to think about it. I'm in the unfortunate position of trying to bring people to think about it um, and, um, and to take responsibility for it. I think at the end of the day, it's my responsibility as a citizen. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna read these two questions in the chat um, and whoever wants to respond to them is welcome to do so. Actually three. First we have from Harold, uh, Harold Weinstein. Weinstein, Weinstein, uh, APAC in the USA has been leaning toward endorsing some far right conservative Congress people. The Sierra Club has stopped touring in Israel after pressure from far left progressives. Congress has still agreed to provide support and weapons to Israel from which the USA gets money back from Israel when they buy the weapons. How can this be balanced? The US has supplied weapons to all sorts of dictators over the years. Is Israel any different? Brian writes, what is keeping Israel from an ethical policy on selling weapons to bad actors? Lauren Blatt asks, do any Israeli political figures stand with the law that you are promoting? Michael Cronenfeld asks, would the panel also include representation from Israeli Arabs? Uh, Jack asks, what are the implications of saying no to Ukraine? So that's a whole lot of questions. Do um, any of the three you want to jump in on any of those? I'll be done. You know the most about this. I mean, I think you should just teach us. Um, uh... Yeah, I spoke a lot, though, <laughs> and uh, I'd be happy, Daniel, if, if you want to jump in on organization. Um, so, um, so as far as um, the keeping Israel from an ethical policy on, I'll, I'll, I'll say as, as far as the as, as the United States. So, again, as I mentioned, the United States does have a law. Um, I don't think any any country is uh, is doing it perfectly. Um, and and there's always work to be done, um, but but the United States has has had a law for the last two decades, um, which has set a moral limit. And and again, it, it's there have still been questions and there have still been problems, but right now Israel is just in a in another leap. We are in a in a quantum leap away from that. I would be happy that we would get to a place where we are similar, as I said, to the United States and not to Russia and North Korea. Um, and, and then there'll still pro there'll still be work to be done, obviously, just like any time you pass a law, you need people who are who are making sure that the law is is applied in, in the right ways and, and, and people are, are, are following it. Um, but but right now, when there isn't a law, um, and for me, this is really the critical point. I just feel as a citizen that I'm implicated in the policy of, of the of the state of Israel. And I, I think going back, I think in other ways, maybe in lesser ways, really, diaspora Jews are also uh, implicated in, in these decisions. But for me, as a as a citizen in a democracy, the policy uh, implicates me. It, it makes me a partner to it. Um, there are Israeli political figures who, who stand with the law. Unfortunately, Tila is, is no longer in the Knesset. Um, but she was one, but but there are others. In fact, in, in the current coalition, I would say there are more than there have ever been um, within a coalition who who stand with this law. There are lawmakers, certainly in Meretz and in Avoda, um, but also certainly within Yeshatid, um, and even um, and even in, in Yamina and in Tikva Chadasha, um, even on the right. Something that I didn't mention, but which is remarkable about this issue is that you can find um, people from the far right who are also very willing to endorse it, people who, who I don't share very much ideology and, and beliefs with personally, but on this, we, we really agree. Uh, somebody like Moshe Feiglin also speaks very uh, clearly about this, or uh, a religious figure like Rabbi Shlomo Aviner, Rabbi Chaim Druckmann also speak about this. So there is, um, there is a, a real potential for a, a broad, broad consensus within the people and within political actors. But my experience from politicians is that they won't and they really can't act when they don't have a public pushing them um, because the counter forces are, are so significant. Until there is a really strong public voice, the politicians just don't have a mandate to move forward. They say, you know, who is behind this? Who, why, why am I doing this? As soon as they, they have that, they'll have the, um, I think they will have the the ammunition is maybe a bad metaphor to that they need in order to move it forward ethically um, there are a number of of politicians that uh, that that are there um, 
would the panel include representation from from Israeli Arabs? I think it's 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 possible. Um, I don't think in the 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 makeup of the panel, um, it's people who need to have a certain amount of of security clearance in order to be involved in the discussions that are of a sensitive national security nature. Um, but you know, certainly, I don't think um, definitionally there there's anything that would that would say no. Um, but there there are those sensitivities. Um, as far as the implications of saying no to Ukraine, um, if the question is about saying no um, to, so what's interesting about Ukraine is, is there we actually said no to selling them arms um, now. Um, and, and it really demonstrates what um, the, the problematic nature of, of kind of what's going on and, and the way realpolitik is, 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 um, is overcoming moral considerations. Um, we, we're saying no to them right now to provide them with something, with things which are completely, completely um, defensive, iron dome and, and helmets and things like that, meaning things that the, the Gemara speaks about this distinction, that, and that's, those things are more kosher. You know, we could even talk about selling those to, to a murderous regime, but something like a helmet, which can't be used for wrong, and and we're we're not doing it there. Um, whereas years back, we did we were willing to when when it wasn't a problem when we it wouldn't upset Putin too much. We were willing to sell Israeli guns to a neo-Nazi militia within the Ukraine. Um, so it just demonstrates that unfortunately, what what's what's motivating the decisions right now is not the moral is not the moral factor. It is real politic. It's what can be done and what can make money and what can gain us something, but without the, the counterbalance. Thank you. Rav Avidan, if you will kindly put your website in the chat so people can know how to learn more, how to support the work, understand the work. Thank you, Professor Gordas. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hilda Friedman. Thank you, Rabbi Avidan Friedman, for this uh, very important conversation about how we balance our existential threats and survival with our moral aspirations to thrive and be an orla goyim, a light to the nations. Never an easy task for the Jews, but we're up for the challenge and we appreciate you uh, entering the mess here, here of the conversations. Thank you to each of you uh, and thank you for all who joined. Thank you BMHBJ for your partnership and Rabbi Chetavsky. And we hope you'll join us at Valley Beit Midrash tomorrow on a very different conversation, Frankenstein and the Golem with Dr. Paul Root Wolpe. Um, will be talking tomorrow uh, with us. So we hope you'll join us for that. Wishing everyone a good night um, and a strong Tinus Esther, a Tinus Esther, where we embrace the darkness of, of uncertainty of how to stand up against evil, not knowing Purim is coming. We never take our finger off the pulse of, of the negative and yet um, also a Purim Sameach that we could ultimately end in redemption and joy for all of Am Yisrael Tevel. Purim Sameach. All the best. Thank you so much, all of you.